Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I'm Bob Lurlacher, town manager of Reading. And the most important announcement I have to say is you hopefully know where the restrooms are right outside. Uh, welcome to our newly renovated and slightly added on to library. Um, it worked out as a beautiful structure. And I think it added about 17 years to my life. Um, I'd like to especially welcome those of you who are not from Reading. Um, we're very glad to see you here tonight. I'd just like to make a couple quick remarks before we get to our list of speakers, which is really impressive. I joined the town of Reading in 2005 from the private sector. And for any of you that have made that switch, you know that means many years of unending surprises. One of the surprises to me was the complete lack of data. I came from a business that had a lot of data. Um, so one of the things we did over a decade ago was to create a list with the help of a consultant of peer communities. We have about 25 peer communities. And later tonight, you'll hear a little more about that from our economic development director, Andrew Corona. Uh, in early 2016, we began to discuss an operational override. Reading hadn't had one since 2003. We showed a simple table that showed both Reading and the average peer community each collected about $54 million in revenue from residential property. <clears throat> Reading collected about $5 million from commercial, industrial, personal property, and peer communities collected $17 million annually from the same sector. Many in the audience thought our pocket had been picked and where was that $12 million because peer communities should be the same as Reading. And that, that simple table opened up a floodgate of discussion. Everyone knew we were a bedroom community, but all of a sudden, that table kind of did it. Uh, our Board of Selectmen then led a two-pronged approach. First, in the short run, we needed to have an override to increase our funding or to cut our services. And secondly, we needed to take a serious hard look at long-term economic development, especially in the CIP sector. One year ago this month, our override effort failed by a 40 to 60 percent margin. Subsequently, this year in the budget, we eliminated police, fire, and teachers for the first time in many years. So we've balanced the budget, at least for now. The margin, however, was quite alarming. The 40 to 60 percent told us that we were really lousy at communication. And if we were going to delve into economic development and involve the private sector with a typical government mindset, how were we possibly going to do it when we don't know how to communicate with our own residents? Our uh, planning division, led by Assistant Town Manager Jean Delios and Community Development Director Julie Mercier, uh, continues to enjoy a, an unbelievable reputation in the Commonwealth as planners, very strong. A logical approach to economic development was to combine the in-house experience with some outside experience. So in mid-2016, we, we first hired former uh, Reading Community Development Director Jesse Wyman as a part-time economic development liaison and many of you have met Jesse from the peer communities uh, for some of the work she's done. And a few months later, we added Andrew Corona, our full-time economic development director. Uh, Andrew's professional experience from Seattle, New Mexico, and Arizona often leaves him bewildered at, as, at what New England is and why we all act so weird. <laughs> and we do, by the way. Um, I would like to just, call, uh, I won't call you by name, but thanks to the peer community. Several of you are in the room tonight. Uh, for, for helping us on the work we've done and the projects we've worked on. Um, there's been three best practice presentations to the Board of Selectmen, and tonight is the fourth. Um, we also had a final report on economic development factors that I'll make sure you folks get. Um, tonight's another important step on that second point, taking a serious look at economic development. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to first introduce our speaker, uh, Massachusetts Secretary of Housing and Development, Jay Ash. I can confidently speak for mayors and managers across the Commonwealth when I say that Governor Baker, uh, Governor Baker reached across the proverbial aisle, aisle to hire Jay as the first member of his inner circle. We knew the local government had a great seat at the new administration's table. Jay came from a background as city manager in Chelsea for almost 15 years where he, he performed economic development miracles. Uh, Jay is a true... <laughs> <laughs> Jay, is it true that your first job in Chelsea, your boss hired you first and then told you you had no actual budget? <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> you needed to go get grants. Um, I first met Jay because our two communities um, share the same regional vocational school. And since then, I've continued to benefit from his wisdom, his perspective, his polite tenacity, and his infectious optimism. Secretary Ash, once again, welcome to Reading. Wow. Thanks, 
Club, uh, I will tell you that um, in those meetings uh, that we had around uh, Northeast uh, Regional Vocational School and subsequent, every time I have a chance to be with Bob Lasher, I take that opportunity uh, because I um, not only admire uh, the work you do, but uh, I learn something new uh, every day from you. And uh, I learn something new uh, for the positive. Uh, you're lucky to have Bob uh, here in Reading. I think you all know that. Uh, Bob, I really admire your work. I congratulate you on, on all that, uh, that that you represent, not that not only that what you accomplish, but what you represent. Uh, who is at the uh, North Shore Chamber of Commerce breakfast this morning? Nobody, <laughs> good, so I can tell the same jokes then. Uh, <laughs> so today I started my morning in Wakefield. Steve, I didn't see you there. Where were you? <laughs> Actually, is it Wakefield or Linfield? I always get the line mixed up there. The four points, where is that? Is oh, that? that's Wakefield. That's yeah. That is Wakefield? Yeah, we collect the tax on it. <laughs> so I, uh, I started the morning there um, and uh, am ending here. So it's actually this is actually a good day for me uh, because I'm residing in Danvers these days. So I'll get home at a reasonable hour. Uh, tomorrow, no, Friday, my last meeting is in Amherst at 4.30. No, Pittsfield after that at 5.30. So it'll be a long drive back, but uh, this is a good one. Uh, excited to be here because it's great to see communities coming together uh, to talk about their future. Uh, so I'm going to begin this conversation with the ending of the conversation I had this morning. Uh, so I'm going to do stuff in reverse order. This morning I talked about, all, talked about all the wonderful tools that we have, the great partnership we have with the legislature, the spirit of bipartisanship. Bob mentioned that I get uh, that uh, Governor Baker reached across the aisle. I'm a lifelong Democrat serving in a Republican administration. I'm happy to talk about that if you'd like. But I'm going to start where I ended uh, this morning. <coughs> and where I ended this morning was a cautionary tale to all of us. Uh, all of us love um, Eastern Massachusetts. All of us love North Shore. Frankly, I tried to move here uh, when I was leaving Saugus and uh, couldn't find a house in uh, my price range. I ended up in Danvers. But um, all of you love um, Reading or North Reading or Wakefield or all the other communities that are represented here. The cautionary tale is that the world is changing really quickly. And if we don't react from an economic development perspective, uh, not only is the world going to pass us by, but it's going to suck the life out of us as we go by. So here's the story I want to tell you. Um, I talk to big businesses uh, all the time. Um, I'm really confident about Boston's ability to withstand a terrible R that might happen in our future. Right? I don't mention the word recession because I think that's when you bring it on you, but um, I'm confident of Boston, uh, Cambridge, and Somerville's ability to withstand the recession. Why do I say that? Because they have the key ingredient uh, that every business is looking for. Um, frankly, meaning no disrespect to the people in the room here, I don't see a lot of it here today, and that's millennials. Uh, so what's happening is a self-fulfilling prophecy that millennials are coming to Boston, and the big companies that want the millennials are following them. And as a result of them following them, more millennials are coming to Boston, and more big companies are coming to Boston. That stands us in good stead, because that's why GE came from Connecticut uh, to Boston, was it was all about our talent. We talked to them about many other communities, by the way. Took them, uh, took them for a tour around uh, North Shore, uh, uh, the West, and some spots in South Shore. But they, we knew that they um, fell in love with Boston right away, which is fine. They came to Boston, and they're um, adding greatly to our economy there. Uh, they came because of the talent. And when companies uh, from out of state are looking at Massachusetts, they think about the talent that Boston has to offer, and they want to get a part of it. I'm spending an incredible amount of time these days on the uh, possibility of bringing Amazon's second North American headquarters to Massachusetts. Uh, a number of communities, in fact, maybe some in this room, are thinking about uh, submitting a response to Amazon's uh, RFP uh, for sites. Uh, we're going to tell the Massachusetts story and then work with them uh, to see where they want to locate. Um, so I'm spending an incredible amount of time trying to big, big, uh, bring big businesses here, and they uh, invariably focus on Boston. What I don't talk an awful lot about, but I think it's appropriate for both this morning's discussion and this evening's discussion, is that um, as those big companies are coming to Boston, I'm afraid that they're going to be taking um, some companies from the North Shore with them. And so this is a message uh, to all of our municipal leaders here, whether you're a, a town administrator or whether you're a selectman or you're on a planning board. Um, if I were you, what I would be doing is I would be uh, protecting my base first, which means I'd be go reaching out to every business 
that I care about in the community and checking to make sure that I have a good relationship with them. Uh, asking them uh, what they need from town government and um, encouraging them uh, to think about growth and wanting to partner with them. And not until I finish that would I be worried about uh, what I can do on the outside. You see, there are companies that we all know from around this region that are contemplating picking up stakes and moving. Um, I am trying to keep them in Massachusetts. So this is what happens. Uh, company ABC calls and says, you know, uh, we're in town X and um, uh, town government hasn't been that great to us. Uh, we're having trouble getting millennials. Um, there's no public transportation. Uh, campus is old. Um, and we see all the exciting things that are happening in Boston or in Kendall Square and Cambridge. And so we think uh, we're going to move. And so the first thing I do is I say to them, uh, you need to call town government. You need to talk, talk to them about that. And if we can do um, something to help you improve your stead in that community, we want to help you. Sometimes that works and people will call and sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll say uh, that it's already broken, we can't fix it. Um, I have all these companies, I'm not at liberty to give you the names, but I have all these companies running through my head right now that I've had this conversation and they've either left or are contemplating right now leaving their, uh, their host community. Um, so then my job is, all right, Town X, I'm sorry I can't save you, but I've got to save these jobs for the Commonwealth. And um, oftentimes people are working in that company that live in Town X, so I want to save their jobs. So if they relocate to Boston, I'm not going to provide them incentives to do that, but I'm going to do everything I can to uh, make sure that they understand that they're important uh, to Massachusetts and that we want to keep their business. So your end of the bargain, or my ask to you is, um, if you really do care about economic development, and I presume you do because you're all here and, um, and this is the topic tonight, um, I would really um, put out the welcome wagon for people that you've known for a long time, um, that you either have relationships with or worse, you haven't had relationships with, and talk to them about um, how the relationship's going. Now having said that, um, I'm gonna now move forward to the more positive part of, of my discussion. Um, as you're thinking about uh, how you might uh, want to uh, grow your community, uh, you should know that you have willing partners in uh, Baker Polito administration. And because of the bipartisan spirit of the relationship between the administration and the legislature, um, you have the cooperation of state government. So uh, how many of us are happy with what we see in Washington these days? I'm sorry, um, can you hear me back there? Is everybody hear me already? So, so I, I say that all the time. Only once, by the way, there's no good story on this, so don't even ask me. There's no good story. It's just a sad story of aging. Um, so um, only once has one person raised their hand uh, when I've asked that. And I went up to the guy afterwards. I said, you're really happy with what is happening in Washington? He said, no, I just wanted to bust your chops. So, um, <laughs> So we're all frustrated about what we um, see in Washington. Um, I don't think the legislature and the governor get enough credit for what's happening here in Massachusetts because there's a spirit of bipartisanship that's working here. Hey, I'm a member of a Republican administration. When the governor called me, I said, Governor, you know I campaigned against Republicans at one time. He said, yeah, I do know that. And I said, you know, I may have done a dastardly thing or two during those campaigns. He says, I recognize that, but um, you represent what we, the uh, Baker Polito administration, want to represent uh, for our municipalities. So I'm part of the bipartisan spirit, but it goes on to the work with the legislature. So I worked in the legislature for 11 years. For those of you who are followers of politics, I worked for Richie Volk, who was a state rep from Chelsea. Uh, I grew up in Chelsea. Um, and uh, he was the House Majority Leader, and then the, uh, I'm sorry, he was the House Ways and Means Chairman in charge of the state budget, and then the House Majority Leader. Um, lost his effort to become Speaker. I had to leave uh, at the time. So I had experience in the legislature. So when I came back as part of the Republican administration, I ran into some old friends, and they said, yeah, the honeymoon will last a day, maybe a week. And then when I saw them, I said, maybe a month. And then maybe six months, and then maybe a year. Well, this has been a honeymoon for three years. And here's the evidence of that. This isn't just you know one guy um, telling stories. The democratically controlled legislature provided the Republican governor with a billion dollar economic development bill for the Republican governor to go around the state and give out grants. Who doesn't like to receive grants? All right, the governor says to me all the time, Jay, everywhere I go, I hear great things about you. I say, Governor, give me another $100 million to give out grants. You know, there are better things to say about me. So it's a real credit to the Democratic legislature that they care about getting things done, um, and they gave us the vehicle to do that, the Economic Development Bill. And I have to say, it's a credit. I marvel at uh, Governor Baker all the time. Because he doesn't care about the Republican way. 
of doing things or the democratic way of doing things. He only cares about the right way of doing things. So it's been very easy for me to serve, and I'm really inspired by what he um, has done. So the democratically controlled legislature gives the Republican governor an economic development bill. It's your money. You know, we're here to help you. Uh, the thing that we used to say in Chelsea when I was uh, um, uh, city manager for uh, nearly 15 years is you plan the work and then you work the plan. I will tell you that as I go around to cities and towns, there's cities and towns that want to skip those two steps and just want to go right to me giving them the grant. And as much as I uh, want to help them, um, there's something about communities that do the work and then try to work uh, the plan from there that we want to be helpful on. So when we see a community uh, that is being thoughtful about what its future is and is trying to figure out ways to increase its commercial tax base, trying to figure out ways to solve its affordable housing uh, issues, the region's affordable housing issues, uh, when it's trying to figure out um, how, to t how to tie together uh, infrastructure uh, with uh, schools, with cultural activities, uh, to make a community uh, not only a, a strong and vibrant community, but a contributor to a, a greater, stronger, and vibrant uh, region, we want to show up and help, and we have the resources to do so. So some highlights of things that we typically spend money on. Um, I, um, I get called all the time from uh, city managers, town administrators, state reps, and senators uh, for MassWorks money. MassWorks is a classic economic development program. Public comes in and makes investments in infrastructure in return for the private sector coming right in afterwards and creating jobs or building new housing. Uh, the governor is such a big fan of the MassWorks program uh, that we've gone up by about 75 percent of MassWorks since, uh, uh, since we took office and the legislature is such a big fan of MassWorks is they, they've given us the authorization to do so. Uh, so we have uh, funding that's available um, that will provide for things like uh, uh, intersections, will provide for things like utility lines, will provide for things like resurfacing or reconstruction or new construction of roadways if there is an economic development thing happening right afterwards. Now I get a lot of communities that want the first part, hey we get, I, I get one community on the uh, north of Boston that is looking for $9 million to rebuild two miles of, of um, water and sewer lines, but they have no developer uh, afterwards. And I say, I can't, I can't fund that. When there are so many communities that have things ready to go and have the uh, developer behind them. So uh, we're currently in the um, phase of uh, making decisions on the latest round. Um, we have $80 million available. I have $240 million worth of asks. Uh, so, you know, you can do the math. Uh, one out of three uh, communities will get uh, what they're asking for. But when we say no, we <laughs> say no and tell you why, what you need to do in order to better position yourself uh, the next time. So the MassWorks money is available and it's a great vehicle. Uh, I used it in Chelsea um, all the time. Um, there are projects um, uh, throughout the state that are uh, taking advantage of it. Um, so we'll announce awards in two weeks and other 40 communities. Uh, we'll get uh, MassWorks dollars. Um, those uh, communities will build new housing market rate and affordable. Uh, we'll create new jobs. Uh, we'll help uh, local businesses to expand, but we'll also bring in businesses from uh, out of state uh, to the Commonwealth. So that's a really good thing. Uh, so a new administration comes into office, and the law says that a new administration has to come up with a new economic development plan for the state. So for the first year, I went um, around the uh, entire state and listen to lots of people talk about what their hopes and dreams were uh, for our economic development future. Uh, the good news about that was that I thought, after having been in the business for 30 years, I thought I knew everything. And what I found was when I went out to places that I hadn't been to, uh, when I went to places especially further away from Boston, um, I had a lot to learn. And so learn I did and incorporated into our economic development bill, which the leg legislature approved and the governor has now given us the funding to uh, implement. Um, it's really exciting to think about some of the possibilities. A new program that we started was a program that supports the uh, renovation of existing and the development of new industrial and business parks. So in Chelsea, which used to be the industrial capital of the world, I mean, Chelsea was an important part of the Industrial Revolution many, many, many years ago. Uh, I was busy pushing out all that old industry, um, instead trying to build taller buildings. I had limited space, 1.8 square miles, a small town, small city. I had to go vertical in order to achieve what I needed to achieve. So I was pushing old industry out, but in places around the state, that old industry is going to be the bedrock. I, I was able to build hotels and office buildings in Chelsea because of my proximity to Boston. Uh, but others are going to look at these industrial parks because of their proximity 
to the regional highway network or the metropolitan highway, the entire interstate highway network, uh, for example. So we've created this program to help communities that are interested in creating uh, business and industrial parks. Um, a great example of it is not on the North Shore, but a great example of it is the city of New Bedford. Any golfers here? <coughs> Ever been to the Whaling City Golf Course in New Bedford? So there's a public golf course in New Bedford. Begs the question, why does the city run a golf course, right? Um, the city wasn't maintaining it well. Uh, the golf course was kind of run down. Um, subscriptions weren't up. Uh, so the mayor made a courageous decision, went to the city council and said, uh, we have a better idea for the golf course. We're going to take 18 holes and make it nine. And we're going to take the other nine, and we're going to take up Jay Ash's offer uh, to create a new uh, business park. And so uh, we're working right now uh, with uh, the city of New Bedford on that nine holes that is no longer going to be a golf course. And they're going to create a million square feet of uh, potential development uh, right up against the highway, I uh, uh, 195 down there. Um, and that's something that we would like to do around the state. Uh, legislature has authorized it. The governor has given us the money. Mass Development runs the program now. So there's an opportunity that you shall um, know about. Uh, another opportunity, um, uh, and quickly, I don't, am I taking questions or am I? Uh, no, I'm just uh, presenting. So I'll, um, I'll end quickly. Uh, another new opportunity is um, uh, collaborative workspace. So I uh, found this in Orange Mass. Orange Mass, who's been to Orange Mass? If you haven't been there, you've been there. It's an old industrial town. Imagine the river running through it, industrial buildings next to the river. The river used to power the industrial buildings in the Industrial Revolution. Manufacturing goes offshores. The people leave the industry. The buildings start falling apart. Right? You've all seen them. Well, the f interesting thing about Orange Mass is an entrepreneur came by and bought one of those old rotting uh, industrial buildings. And currently, there are 43 companies operating out of there, employing more than 150 people. They've created an innovation center, the Orange Innovation Center. I saw it. I liked it. We replicated it. The uh, legislature has approved it. So we have money now to support uh, the creation of new innovation centers. And we think that every city and town should think about that. Every city and town has a spirit of entrepreneurship. Every city and town has a spirit of innovation. The idea is to find a way to nurture that. And the best way to do that is not, to not have people working in their garage in separation and wondering if they're the only ones and why the hell are they staying in Reading when everybody else is somewhere else. But instead, combining in an old school building or an old aging factory or an old retail space um, and seeing that they're not the only ones in the community that are doing that and they can learn from each other, they can help each other, uh, they can get consoled when they need consolation and they can uh, get help to uh, grow their business when they need that. So we are funding that and we've uh, provided uh, funding for 50 of those around the state so far. Uh, great opportunity. Uh, Housing development in downtown is a huge priority for us. Market rate housing in downtowns bring restaurants. Restaurants bring retail. Next thing you know, you've got to revitalize uh, downtown center. So you can't do enough, as far as I'm concerned, you can't do enough market rate housing in the downtown. For those who say, geez, it's too much density, we don't want all the traffic, I tell you, you need to plan accordingly, right? You don't want to overrun yourself. But if you're not doing it, somebody else is going to do it. And if you're not doing it, uh, retail and restaurants are eventually going to leave your downtown and you're going to find yourself uh, wanting for something. Uh, so that, uh, that help is available as well. Uh, we have Brownfields money that's available thanks to the legislature and the governor working together um, so we can uh, help out on Brownfields. We have technical assistance uh, so as you come up with your final economic development plan, uh, we'll have you come in and sit with us, sit with Mass Development, sit with other agencies like uh, Department of Housing and Community Development and talk through the opportunities. We can provide you technical assistance. We have modest grants that can help out as well. So my message in closing is that uh, I started out with a cautionary tale. Um, I think everybody should be realistic. The days that uh, whoever's in Reading is going to stay in Reading are long gone. Uh, but having had that cautionary tale, we have something that no other state in the country has. We have the most educated workforce in the country. We have the number one uh, education system in the country, K through 12. We have the number one quality of life in the country. We are the number one state for innovation in the country. Number one in life sciences. The number ones go on and on and on. And then U.S. News and World Report this summer, uh, first ever compilation, comes out and says that Massachusetts is the number one overall state. So there are lots of good things that are happening. There are lots of people that are looking at communities around the Commonwealth that want to invest in those communities. There are some that are in those communities wondering whether they should stay and invest. And my message to you is plan the work and then work the plan and good things will happen for you. So that's my story.
It's not often I have to move the microphone down two feet. But. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, uh, with apologies from both of our representatives, Brad Jones and uh, Jimmy Dwyer, their session was running late. But I do have a great pleasure to next introduce our state senator, Jason Lewis, who's going to give us a legislative overview. Senator. Yay. <laughs> Gotta love Jay Ash. <laughs> At least somebody is enthusiastic. Enthusiastic about me. I um, thank you, Bob. I'm uh, thrilled to to be with you. It's great to see how many uh, folks are here tonight. Um, I'm uh, Senator Jason Lewis. For those of you who don't know me, I have the privilege of representing Reading, Wakefield, Melrose, Malden, Stoneham, and Winchester. And I really am here tonight speaking on behalf of our entire uh, legislative delegation which in the spirit of, uh, of uh, bipartisanship that, uh, that Secretary Ash was talking about, that's exactly what we have right here in Reading um, with uh, Representative Jim Dwyer uh, and Representative Brad Jones. Uh, Representative Jones, some of you know, is, is uh, actually the minority leader in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And we, our great team, work uh, very closely together on, on a lot of issues that affect the uh, local community here in Reading. Uh, as well as uh, uh, statewide issues as well. Um, I'm thrilled to, to uh, see uh, this event tonight, to come together talking about our um, local economic development plans. I think it's uh, terrific that we also have people in the room tonight from some other communities outside of Reading, because I think that the uh, key message tonight um, is, is one of partnerships. It's partnerships um, at the local level between different um, you know, parts of town government and uh, the business community and various community organizations. It's partnerships across communities in regions, because I think more and more has to happen you know, on a regional level. It's partnerships, uh, as Secretary Ash was talking about, between uh, local communities and our state, partnerships between different parts of state government, which uh, we know can also be challenging at times. Um, and that's how we get things done. Um, you know, Secretary Ash uh, said that, um, uh, you know, in, in a number of recent surveys, Governing Magazine, uh, US News and World Report, you know, Massachusetts has been ranked as the top uh, uh, state economy in the nation or in, in the top five. And um, that's pretty remarkable. I mean, when you think about the competition we have out there, you know, in California and uh, and New York and uh, you know a lot of other uh, Texas you know a lot of states that uh, have very strong economies and very strong um, you know business uh, base but the reason Massachusetts is is so strong you know we are obviously one of the most educated states just recently we um, passed we were the first state to have more than half of our population with a uh, with at least a college degree or higher we were the first state to pass that milestone we have an incredible K through 12 system we have very strong higher education. Um, we have a very strong innovation economy, obviously technology, clean energy, um, healthcare, biotech, um, and, uh, cybersecurity, and many other areas. Um, those are all key factors. But I also think that another factor is, the, is bipartisanship, you know, is the fact that um, we do really work hard at, at working together, whether that's in the legislature, I can tell you within the state senate, um, some of many of you know Senator Tarr, um, who's the minority leader, represents uh, probably some of your communities. You know, I'm a Democrat. We work extremely closely together, and um, you know, we respect each other even when we disagree. The same is absolutely true with, with Governor Baker, and, and I give the governor a tremendous amount of credit for the way he has been leading our state, and that did start, you know, with um, the, the folks that he named uh, to, to his cabinet when he, when he came into office, Secretary Ash being the first one. But I can say, speak volumes about Secretary Mary Lou Sutters, who heads our Health and Human Services, um, our Secretary of Veterans Affairs, um, and, and many others. Um, they are all uh, people who are <coughs> dedicated to doing what's best for the Commonwealth and our communities. And it's, a, it's really a pleasure to, to work together. So I hope that that you know, cooperation, that, part of, that, that spirit of partnership, you know, does at least hope, hopefully also contribute in a positive way to our economic development uh, in the state. So let me just give a few remarks on a few other things. Um, there, as you already uh, heard, uh, economic development is a, cre a key priority for our state legislature. 
Um, every year, one of the most important, probably the most important pieces of legislation that we tackle you know, is our annual state budget. It's roughly around $40 billion now, so it's, it's very significant. Um, and there's lots of decisions that are made in the state budget um, that are very important to our local economies and communities. Um, it would take me all night to go through, but just a, a few, obviously, our funding for our public schools, which is known as Chapter 70, which is uh, something even through the Great Recession, we've continued to, to protect and, and grow that, that funding. Um, chapter 90, which is funding for our um, local roads and infrastructure. Uh, local aid, which helps support um, public safety, senior centers, and other local services. I could go on and on. And that's, uh, again, very much a partnership between the uh, administration and the legislature in setting those priorities. There are a lot of tough choices that we have to make um, because resources are you know, always constrained and there's never as much as we would like to be able to invest. That's a critical, uh, and we uh, focus every year. And then, as Secretary Ash was uh, referring to, um, virtually every legislative session, um, the <coughs> legislature works with the governor on a major economic development bill. And that typically um, reauthorizes funding for programs that have a proven track record, MassWorks being a great example of that, Brownfields, um, the IQ triple, uh, what's it, the I cubed program. There's a number of them. We do try to look hard at these programs, you know, not just throw money at them again, but are they, do they have a track record of success? Do we have proven results? You know, what have we been able to accomplish by making those investments? Um, and then reauthorize those. So that, that's something I expect the legislature will take up again this session. Um, and again, we do that working closely with our local communities, um, with um, the administration, with the business community and others in terms of you know, where, is it, uh, where are those limited dollars best uh, invested. So I, I expect that will be upcoming. Um, the um, Massachusetts uh, Senate um, recently created a new task force on uh, strengthening local retail. And I mention that because I think that's a, a significant part of our economy, particularly our local economies, that is facing some very significant challenges. Um, I chair the, um, I'm the Senate Chair of the Labor and Workforce Development Committee. Um, so in that capacity, I was appointed to serve uh, on this new task force. Um, and the, uh, let me just read the charge of this uh, task force, which is, uh, was created uh, by both the Senate President and the Senate Minority Leader. It includes legislators as well as members of the business community um, and uh, experts on retail. But it in, in the, the focus will be challenges fo faced by our local retailers in competing against um, online sellers, which we know is, is a, a major, major challenge for our brick, brick and mortar um, businesses. Closures of local retail establishments and the impact that this has on local economies and on our local property tax bases. Initiatives by local retailers to increase their market share. And then of course how state and local <coughs> governments can support our local retailers and encourage uh, shop local. So I know we don't have maybe that many retailers in the room tonight, but we all understand that we don't have healthy downtowns, we don't have healthy main streets if we don't have retail and restaurants. Um, and we know they're facing, particularly retailers, major, major challenges um, with the cost of doing business and, uh, and with the competition uh, from online. So I'm pleased that the Senate has taken this initiative on. We're gonna be traveling around the state to get perspectives from different regions. We uh, will be talking with, um, obviously, with um, uh, members of Secretary Ash's team and uh, academic experts. And, and I also want to encourage um, folks in the room tonight, you know, our town planners, uh, town managers, you know, and obviously our business, local business community to um, it provide your input to us. I will, I'm in the process of organizing an event with the Melrose Chamber of Commerce. And, I, and I'm, my intention is to invite the Reading Chamber, the Wakefield Chamber, others to join us when we do that um, so we can uh, have an opportunity to get you know, your input. And, the, and again, the, the purpose is to not just identify the challenges, but to really identify solutions as well in ways that we can, um, we can make a difference in supporting that important sector of our economy. You know, we always talk a lot about the tech economy, we talk about innovation, we talk about life sciences, we talk about clean energy. Those are 
absolutely <coughs> critical drivers to the overall state economy. Um, but we also need to remember some of our traditional, um, you know, traditional sectors like retail. Um, when we talk about uh, local economic development, I think it's also very important that we take a kind of comprehensive, you know, holistic and inter interdisciplinary uh, approach to it. So a few of the, the other areas and issues that I think um, you know, are very important to keep in mind are transportation. Um, one of the keys to economic development in this area is um, good public transportation. We're, we're blessed, obviously, in both Rake, uh, Reading and Wakefield, um, some of our other communities, to have um, commuter rail service. Some of our communities also have bus service. Um, you know, that's been a major concern, that we haven't had the quality and the reliability of service that we need to have. Um, and it isn't just when we had the, uh, the winter of, uh, which was a two years ago, you know, and, and uh, the uh, commuter rail fell apart. You know, even in good times, um, we still struggle to have the level and quality of service that, that we need to have. So I think there's a, this is a major focus for the uh, governor. Um, with the efforts to reform the MBTA. The legislature has been closely partnering on that. Um, there are several recent reports that were just released, one from the state senate, which was based upon a, st a statewide listening tour that we did earlier this year, another one from the Mass Taxpayers Foundation, and I think a third was from the Pioneer Institute, all basically calling for a renewed uh, and continued focus on our transportation infrastructure. That. You know, even when we're, we get that top ranking for many things, like our education system, you know, in the state, one area we don't rank so high in, you know, is, is our infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, part of that is obviously it's a lot of old infrastructure. We deal with very harsh winters that they don't deal with in some parts of the country. But we've got to figure out how to continue to increase the investment in our infrastructure that includes our roads, our bridges, our public transit. Um, and I can, I want to assure all of you that you know, we, I talked to uh, Keolis, you know, who's the commuter rail, off, commuter rail operator frequently. We are looking to make sure we hold their feet to the fire, um, that we continue to do things to improve our public transit service. And I think we have made strides, but again, it's an area we've got to stay focused on, and it is critical to our, our families, our businesses, and local economic development. Um, second is the, what uh, Secretary Ash mentioned, which is housing. If we don't find a way to increase our housing stock, we will put a halt to growth in the greater Boston region. Um, it's a tough, tough problem to solve um, because um, you know, den more, dense, more density is not something that's always popular. We have concerns about um, adding more students in our schools and how do we accommodate those. We have concerns about, again, about transportation infrastructure and putting more, more cars on the road. So uh, it's challenging. We held a, um, a community conversation actually right here in this room a few months ago on this topic of housing. Um, we had actually Crystal Cornegay joined us that evening uh, and from Secretary Ash's group. She was terrific. Talked about a range of programs that the administration has working with the legislature again to help support the uh, additional housing. And I'm a firm believer that there are ways to do that right. I think Reading is a great example of that. The 40R district that Reading created some years ago now, and I think it's it recently expanded, um, is a great model. It's right by the commuter rail. It's right by the downtown. It's an opportunity to encourage um, more market rate and some affordable um, housing as part of that as well. Um, and I really want to encourage and see more of that. I think there's good opportunity for that in uh, Wakefield and some of the other communities um, that, that I represent. So that's an area we want to continue to stay focused on. Um, Health care, you may say, why do I bring that up? What does that have to do with this? But um, health care costs and the continued uh, inexorable rise in health care costs, I think, is a real risk to um, our success for um, our business uh, community, um, for many of our families that are struggling to make choices between you know, making, uh, purchasing food or other goods and services and paying for their health care. Um, and this is a huge challenge for government, local government and state government. It's squeezing out our ability to make the investments we need to make in housing, in transportation, in education, 
in directly in economic development. So we have to stay focused on how do we continue to have a great healthcare system. We have one of the, the best in the world, but, and we want to maintain access to that healthcare for everybody. But we've got to do better at, at uh, delivering that care efficiently and lower cost. The governor has put forward some important initiatives. The legislature is working hard on this. You will see a major piece of legislation from the state senate in several weeks' time that will look to tackle a whole range of different issues, including pharmaceutical costs, including unnecessary um, uh, ER visits and readmissions, and, and a whole bunch of other areas, some of which are going to be controversial. Some of the hospitals are not going to love every proposal that we put forward. Um, Secretary Ash was sharing his story earlier of how he got his surgery, how many different stops he had to make in our unintegrated healthcare <laughs> system. And all of that adds cost, and we all pay for that one way or the other. So I mentioned that tonight. Again, it seems an ancillary issue, but I think that's it's critical when you connect these dots. Um, and then along the same lines, energy as well. Energy costs are also a very significant challenge in our state. And uh, the key, I believe, is combination of improved energy efficiency, which actually we lead the nation in energy efficiency, but there's a lot more we can do. And it's bringing online new sources of clean energy. Um, we are already doing a lot when it comes to solar energy. And I believe that um, Massachusetts can be the Saudi Arabia of wind. You look at the resources that we have um, offshore, um, and it's tremendous, tremendous potential to d deliver energy efficiently and cheaply. We passed some very important legislation last year, uh, again, working in a bipartisan way, that will lead to um, major offshore procurements for wind energy power, and that is underway. So we will look to see that come online. So there are things we are doing to bring online new sources of clean energy, <coughs> renewable energy, along with energy efficiency. It's not going to solve our energy needs and our high prices overnight, <coughs> but I think it is going to take us in the right direction. And again, we bring if we get a better handle on those costs, and obviously that also helps to provide for a cleaner uh, en environment and drive um, green energy jobs, that again frees up uh, resources that can be invested in other places um, rather than going into uh, going to other states to pay for natural gas and uh, energy. Um, the last thing I wanted to just mention um, was the, um, the, the value and the opportunity in the creative economy. Um, I want to sing the praises here of uh, what Wakefield's been doing. Um, I don't know if Steve Mayo is still here. I mean, Steve may have just stepped out. But um, they have, uh, they're in the process of creating a cultural district. Um, and it's centered around something called the Albion Cultural Exchange which is a, a, a facility that the town owned that they've repurposed into an, essentially an arts and cultural center. And it's just amazing what they're doing with that, how it's getting the community involved, and how they've um, integrated that in with the local economy. So they're doing all kinds of arts nights and uh, cultural festivals, working with the local um, businesses and restaurants, partnering with them. It's bringing um, people back to the downtown. You know, people who maybe didn't go downtown, maybe would go shop at the Burlington Mall or just go online, are saying, hey, no, I'll go downtown. There's something fun happening there. Let's go check that out. And while they're there, maybe they eat dinner at a restaurant or shop at some of the stores. You know, we have to think differently about how we make our downtowns vibrant. Um, it, 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 the need for being a destination for entertainment, for dining options, for having it be a nice, you know, a nice destination. That's where something like the um, Complete Streets Initiative that Reading's pursuing, a lot of other communities are pursuing, um, you know, where we're looking to think about not just moving cars through, but how do we make it a, a, a accessible and safe for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for public transit. I'm so pleased that our communities are embracing that program. Um, when I was in the state, uh, when I was a state representative before I became a senator, I actually was the lead sponsor on the legislation to create a complete st streets program, and it got included in a two th 2014 bond bill. And it's so exciting, three years later, you know, to actually see this come to fruition, to see our communities embracing this, and getting you know, funding now in return from the state to support these initiatives. Um, again, it improves transportation, it improves the desirability, the walkability, the attractiveness of our downtowns, <coughs> um, which again has a virtuous um, as, uh, effect 
on um, being able to grow our local business uh, business community. So I um, think that's another thing to, to keep in mind as well. Um, I, uh, again, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm really here also to, um, to listen and learn you know, from, from all of you, um, again, about how best we can partner the state level, the local level, with the administration, with the legislature, with our business community, with our community partners, uh, with our uh, developers and, and others, because that's how we're going to get the job done. Um, again, I want to bring greetings uh, from the entire delegation, Representative Brad Jones, Representative Jim Dwyer, who, again, wish they could be here with us tonight. Um, and again, um, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to be here and to say a few words. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, when I was thinking of the bar bipartisanship that uh, the two prior speakers mentioned, um, I'm the boots on the ground locally, and I can tell you quite honestly, I have not spent two seconds thinking about am I speaking to a Democrat or Republican, and how do I phrase the next thing I'm going to ask for yeah. or talk about? Never. So that you're absolutely right, and thank you for that. <coughs> uh, our next speaker will be our Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Barry Berman. Uh, the reason Barry's here is he's our liaison to the planning and economic development section of the government, and he has a background in that. And Barry's going to come come explain to all of you what that Reading is open for business. Barry. Boy, it's always hard to follow Jay Ash. Um, but I'll tell you, one time Jay Ash followed me um, at Clark University. I graduated in 1980. Jay followed 1983. He won't tell you because um, he's modest, but he was the greatest basketball player that ever graced the hardwood at Clark University. Um, I wasn't. I got cut from an intramural team on a Division III school. So, um, you know, we all found our, kind of found our paths. And I'm hoping that that Clark connection increases our chances more at one out of three of getting a grant. I'm hoping so. You we also have, yeah. <laughs> and also we have Gene, who also was a Clark grad. So. And an intramural basketball And an intramural basketball player. So it all, better than Barry. It, oh, much better than me. <laughs> it doesn't take much to be better than me. So um, thank you all for coming. And, and welcome, to, for those of you who aren't um, from Reading or here for the first time, welcome to our wonderful library. I like to consider this our first really great economic development project. Because as Jay will tell you and some of the developers in the room may tell you, they really, developers, investors really look at towns um, who invest in themselves to make investments in. So this was a great investment that Reading made to itself um, that we're really proud of. And, and, I, and it's a showcase and it's a marvel. Um, and we're really proud to show it off. So um, in homage to my friend Bill Brown and Virginia Adams, who are the town historians, I wanted to start off tonight with something that um, I pulled out of um, the 1935 Reading Town Report. Um, and it was a report of the Publicity Committee. And I'm just going to read a couple of sentences to you on here, see if you can find a, a pattern. Uh, Reading Board of Selectmen, gentlemen, the objective of the promotion and publicity campaign for the town of Reading, instituted by your board through this committee, was and is to develop an interest in the town among those people who would make desirable residents of the town and who may be contemplating the purchase or construction of a home. If such a campaign is successful, it would mean that the total valuation of the town would be increased to the point where the income received would be sufficient to continue the many fine services at present rendered. And beyond that, if possible, lower our tax rate. Always worried about that, weren't they? In addition to the natural effect will be to increase the gross business of all business institutions as well. Your committee has developed a rather comprehensive promotion program, which at the present time is partially completed. This program to date has met with the approval of all far-sighted people and will no doubt be carried through to completion. And it goes on to talk about what they kind of did. But fast forward 82 years, here we are at town struggling with taxes, trying to keep our services at a decent level and trying to creatively think out of the box ways to grow our town and bring people in. Sound familiar? 82 years ago they were dealing with that. So why are we here and why are we doing this? Like our friends 82 years ago, um, we're at an economic crossroads. Our need and desire and expectation of high quality municipal services have outpaced our ability to pay for them without significant influx of new revenue. There are only two ways to enhance revenue in Massachusetts, and they're not mutually exclusive. 
One is a continuous and painful campaign to pass Proposition 2 and a half operating overrides. Those in periodic debt exclusions um, to fund significant capital projects like this wonderful library dominate the body politic, leaving precious little energy for anything else. Or two, grow the pie. Um, as you heard earlier from Bob, we bring in less than $12 million on average um, in the commercial industrial property tax base than our peers. $12 million a year on a $100 million enterprise. That's a big, big number. Um, and so what the selectmen have, have worked upon is try to figure out how do we do one, how do we do number two to make number one less frequent and less painful. But it does beg the question, if we grow economic development, won't that alter the face of renting and permanently change who and what we are? I don't think so. Our task together is to strategically close the commercial industrial gap, retaining the tree-lined bedroom community we've grown to love. And I think we can do it. Our process began by doing our homework. Like Jay said, what was it? Make the plan, do the plan? Plan the work. Plan, work plan the work. OK, so plan the work. We did our homework. Um, and it started really with an honest, hard look at ourselves in the mirror. Who are we? What's ready? What are our strengths? What are our assets? What do we need to do to improve upon? Um, I'm in the process right now of trying to launch a high school senior into college. And, it's, and doing economic development is, is, is pretty much very similar to that. You have a kid with 1,300 SAT scores, a B-plus average, and plays a sport. That's great, trying to go to all the colleges. But you know what? So does Wakefield. So does Melrose. So does North Reading. So is Wilmington. Um, so does Linfield. So does Stoneham. They're all great kids. How do you distinguish yourselves um, to the development community to the point where they look at you and want to do business with you? So um, we looked in the mirror and figured out um, what are we going to do? So in 2014, we engaged the services of Professor Barry Bluestone from the Dukakis Center at Northeastern um, for an economic development self-assessment tool, or EDSAT, um, where, um, where we did just that. We followed it up a year later um, with an economic development action plan through a grant from Mass Area Planning Council. So doing all that work, what did we learn? We learned that Reading has a lot to offer and is, a, and is very attractive from a development perspective. Highway access. We have four highway access points in Reading. That's to move goods and service, uh, move goods and also move people. We have MBTA commuter rail, commuter rail access. In 30 minutes, you can get to Boston. But more importantly, in 30 minutes, you can get to Reading from Boston. Jay's millennials want to live in Boston. Maybe they can work here in Reading, and it's only a 30 minute train ride away. Um, we have an educated workforce. Um, developers and, and business owners, they want the ability to hire locally, and that's attractive to them. Spending power. On that, we have a higher than average median income, and that's a plus for relocating companies wanting to do business here. We have money to spend. Our utility rates, they're amongst the lowest in the Commonwealth. Um, you, don't, you don't think about it when you get your bill sometimes, but you know, talk to your neighbors, uh, NSTAR or some of the other companies. They're 20% lower here in Reading. That makes us attractive to firms who use a lot of power. Um, a server farm, maybe some of the innovation companies that Jay is talking about, we can bring in a track with low rates. We have a low commercial tax rate. Um, and this has been a contentious point in Reading, um, but even if the selectmen do a small shift in taxes away from the residential onto the commercial, um, we will still be a, have a significantly lower tax rate um, than any of the peer communities that touch us. The other thing is we're physically attractive. From our downtown to our parks, our con conservation area, Reading is really pretty. You combine that with a thriving arts community, and this is a wonderful place for firms and employees. Um, and through MAPC, we developed four, we identified four development opportunities that really made sense for us to look at really hard. The South Main Street area, the downtown, the area behind RMLD, and the area by the DPW garage. So those are the things that we really looked at, and thought, well, these are our assets and these are our opportunities. But we also learned some things about what we needed to do to get better, to improve, to make ourselves really attractive. For one, our permitting process, sorry, it was a mess. Um, it was a hodgepodge, it was confusing and it was frustrating. Um, people didn't know what to do, they got two sets of directions, it needed to be worked. Our zoning code was a hodgepodge mess, like seven bad additions to your house. Um, there was no one place 
um, where you can get information. We had nobody selling the town. Um, so no one was recruiting investors to come here and no one had the ultimate responsibility to work with them if they happened to show up at our door. Um, that's not the case now. Um, and we needed a development plan. Um, unlike 40B, which you all know, um, the development drives you. You have no control over it. Uh, you have no say. Um, so we wanted to do something beyond that. And I, know, I don't know if Bob touched upon it, but it might have been released locally that through the hard work of Jean Delios um, and Julie Mercier and the, and the town staff, we just got a two-year hiatus from the state for 40B developments. Two years, we're done. That means for the next two years, we can concentrate on our plan, on what we want to do, what we want to engage with, and not have to worry about dealing with people coming in with their ideas of what's good for Reading. So we're going to use these two years to our advantage. So what did we do to mitigate that? Well, we hired a permits coordinator to assist with streamlined with permitting. Is it perfect? Not yet. But the goal is to have someone come in, learn what he or she needs to do, be given the laundry list of items, and get on their way, get this thing done. Um, town staff, the ZBA, and town meeting painstakingly revamped the zoning code. It's now easier to follow without conflicting sections. We expanded accessory apartments to support multi-generational families staying together. Um, but we still have work to do, um, th uh, things that we didn't deal with, maybe like things like Airbnb and other uses that we didn't anticipate. So the zoning will always go back to, it always changes, but now it's, it's one document that doesn't conflict. We published a guide called Doing Business in Reading so folks know where to go and who to see. Um, we began uh, an economic development website for the first time. I think that may even be it on the screen that I'm touching on, <laughs> on the laptop here. Um, so that's one place that people can go. They can access it through our website. Um, and we hired our salesman, Andrew Corona. Um, he was brought in as our economic development coordinator, our cheerleader, someone who's going to basically make people stop uh, on 28 and not just go through us, to really look at us, look under the hood in Reading. Um, this was something that the selectmen really uh, kind of pulled rank on a, a year or so ago. Bob doing his job, sort of figuring, trying to pinch the pennies, maybe didn't think we had it in the budget. The selectmen unanimous, unanimously said, we need this. This is going to separate us from all the other towns. And I think it, um, it's really starting to pay off. Uh, we expanded the 40R district to downtown. Um, so now, in addition to the 40B on Lincoln Street, which was not our idea, um, there are now two other projects. Um, the adaptive um, reuse of the post office, um, uh, which would pass CPDC, and then there's a proposed uh, proposal for 24 Gould. So these three projects combined are going to bring in roughly 150 new households to living in the downtown. Um, it's going to be a boon for our downtown merchants. Um, retail and commercial space that these, pro pro uh, these projects are going to do are going to um, have people working downtown who are going to utilize our downtown businesses because most people in Reading, they leave town to go to work every day. We're going to have people living and working downtown. And as Jay said, take care of your downtown. You need to take care of your downtown. We're doing that. Um, and then um, lastly, um, as Bob announced last week, we're working collaboratively with Wakefield in the state to move the DPW garage to Camp Curtis, Curtis Guild, freeing up valuable space for commercial development. Um, it's going to be a long time. It's not a done deal. It's, it's, going to, it, it's, it's going to be a huge undertaking. But if we pull this off, it'll be a game changer. It'll move the needle in, on our CIP more than anything else that we can possibly do. Um, and it's a project that we really need to keep our eyes on. But I want to also talk for two seconds about um, what economic development doesn't mean. Um, and I can hear as I'm speaking, you know, the social media chatter going about how we're starting to ruin downtown, we're ruining the town, it's changing. Um, the selectmen are um, adamant about not going guns blazing, building fence post to fence post. We're not Houston um, with unfettered building and sprawl. Um, we are being strategic, we're being thoughtful, um, and the developments that we envision are targeted and managed. We're following the existing rules, density that's going to make sense, projects that are going to make sense. We're not changing the complexion of the town. We're just maximizing the few opportunities that we have left. The selectmen have no desire to change Bedford Falls into Pottersville. We're not trying to do that. Um, but we do acknowledge, will this increase development? Um, will it impact some folks negatively? Yes, it's going to. We acknowledge that. But we're going to do all that we can to mitigate the inconveniences and work with the investors to be good neighbors. 
and ensure what they build fits in with the character of the town. CPTC will demand that and so will we. We no longer have the luxury of saying no to everything just because it's changed. We've paid a, pr a price for that dearly. We're not gonna do it again. But we do have to make sure that yes is something that we can be proud of. We're not just gonna build for the sake of building. It's gonna be something that we can all be proud of. Um, the town doesn't ultimately determine, though, what's going to get built. The market is going to determine what's going to get built. We can't control that. Our role as leaders, though, is to open the door, not to build a wall. And that door is open, folks. So in 1935, I'm sure there were those who lamented the loss of all the farmland and the influx of those city slickers. Um, but when the town mothers and fathers convene in the year 2099, 82 years from now, um, for the next iteration of what's going to make Reading um, uh, on its path, um, I hope that they'll look back at us, um, that we gave them a roadmap um, that they could follow in a way to do it the right way. So um, for those of you who are outside of Reading, those of you thinking about investing here in Reading, you have willing, able partners who are um, delighted that you're here. Um, we want to work with you. We, we, we welcome you. Um, and I think that you're going to love it here as much as we do. So. Thank you very much, and um, I'll turn it off. Thank you, Barry. Now that the Clark University cat is out of the bag, I have to confess, especially to Jay, that I was very tempted to invite President David Angel here tonight. Um, you remember we were out and we, we met him a while back. Um, I wish they were closer. They're out in Worcester, if anyone doesn't know, because I know the way they work, and they would love to work with us as a town on this issue. And I've given that a lot of thought, and I just don't know if the distance is too great. But Reading would be very open to that. Yeah. So while I did not invite him here today, a donation is a long I, I do have to caution the three Clark grads that I do have photos from your undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> number, number 24. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I just wanted to start by saying thank you all for coming out. I know this time of year is just so very busy, and we're all running, running, running. And so to come to a meeting like this and make the time to be here and, um, and listen and, and hopefully um, start thinking about how really everyone in this room is part of this. And we're so much, the way we, we work today in local government, and I've been doing this since I graduated from Clark University, so that's a very long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, this, this has been my career, planning and community development. This is what I have been doing for the better part of three decades, and I've worked in other cities and towns. Um, I worked at the MBTA for a while, um, but I am a city planner. That's what I do. And I brought my notebook to show you that I can carry all my paper with me like a good bureaucrat, too, mm -hmm. because we have spent a lot of time studying, uh, analyzing, and reaching out to our community partners to, to, to work together. Um, you know, back in the old days when I first started doing this, and no offense to my esteemed colleague, the state had all kinds of money. And you know, you fill out a couple of two, three page paperwork, and all of a sudden you had all this money. And you could just go crazy doing stuff. Those days are gone. Now we talk about community partners because we can't, we don't have the money. Uh, we have to get creative and think outside of the box about how can we, how can we meet our goals? And what are our goals? When I first came for the interview eight years ago, the then town manager uh, said to me, well, do you have any questions about Reading? And I said, yeah, I do. I said, what's Reading's personality? What's it known for? 
you know, I grew up in Arlington, so, you know, we had all that history and the Jason Russell House and all that. What's Reading known for? And he looked at me and he said, well, we're a town that really likes sports. I thought, that's it? There's got to be more. <laughs> and, and we continue to uh, work through that in some of the things that we're doing in the planning arena. So um, I'm also very pleased that October is National Community Development Month, for those of you who didn't know, uh, which is a great opportunity to, to have an event like this. But I, I also used to say in one of my previous communities, I'd go before the Finance Committee, again, begging for money to do planning. Um, I'd say to the Finance Committee, you know, show of hands, how many people know what planning is? And I don't mean estate planning, I mean city planning. Uh, so I'll ask this, this room, how many people know what planning is? How many people could raise a hand and be like, I know what that is? Not you, Joe guy. <laughs> Um, so, so we have some people that know, which is amazing because no one really knows what it is. Um, sometimes I don't, I'm not really sure what it is. Um, but, I, but I did spend some time looking at my American Planning Association uh, inbox and, um, and I liked what the APA described it as, which is a way to provide a vision for a community. And that's really what I was trying to get, back, get at eight years ago in that interview, like what is the vision for this community? Where does this community, you know, I, I like to think about the future, of course the present, but, but the future. Where does this community see itself? And how can we get there? That, that's the kind of thing that I like to do. Um, I mean, when you think about 10, 15 years of what will this town look like? What do we want it to look like? And those are the questions that we spend a lot of time in paper um, thinking about and engaging the community. Um, you know, the planners of the world would, would love nothing better than to get in a room and come up with a wonderful plan for how we could do everything. But that plan doesn't mean anything. Jean Delios's plan of <coughs> Reading doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything unless the community is engaged. And I think that's where Reading has tremendous, in addition to all the wonderful things that, that Barry Berman mentioned about what we've accomplished and what we've put together and how we've uh, created a plan and worked a plan, um, we also have a very healthy spirit of collaboration and community participation. And I've worked in other cities and towns where there hasn't been that. And you don't get the same outcome. So I think kudos to everyone in Reading for being so committed to being a voice in the community, because I think that's very important. Um, just to talk a little bit about kind of the planning that we've done, um, master planning is something that planners like to talk a lot about, and we've done a lot of that here. Um, the master plan is really a road map, and economic development is part of that master plan. Um, when I first got here in 2009, Reading cut the ribbon on the new downtown, and that was very exciting. Um, the streetscape improvement program really put um, the polish on downtown Reading. Um, so many of my colleagues will say to me at meetings, I can't believe how beautiful the downtown is. We also, a month after I got here, went to town meeting and asked them if they'd be willing to pass a downtown smart growth district. And that was no easy sell. Any zoning at town meetings, different in cities, any zoning that you do at a town meeting, you need two thirds affirmative, yes. And when I stood up in front of 200 town meeting members and said, this is a good thing, and I'd only been here for a month. I'm sure many people scratched their heads and said, you want to do what? <laughs> but it passed, and, um, and then we went back again, as somebody said uh, six months ago, and asked town meeting, can we expand that downtown district? And town meeting again said yes. So we're very, very pleased that we now have a downtown that has the zoning built in to let us grow, to let us reach some of these planning goals that we've established. And the other piece of, um, of the downtown and the downtown smart growth in particular, and what makes it different from a 40B, is that we have an amazing community planning and development commission that really spends the time, and for anyone who's at the meeting Monday night, we went long till 11 o'clock, 
but really spends the time asking the questions of the developers. How's this gonna work? Talk to me about parking. I need to see a traffic study. Let's make sure if we're gonna do X number of units and redevelop, excuse me, redevelop a, a former commercial industrial site, we need to really understand it. And, and that's hard work. Nothing about that is easy because the neighbors are there and, and they're worried. And I get it, I get it. But if we're gonna do this, we have to work together or it's not gonna work. We can't panic because somebody said it's a building that's gonna be however many feet tall and that's, that's not ready. It's not realistic. What we're talking about is preserving this community but doing some things that take us to the next level. And that's really what I think the economic development goals are of the town of Reading. And I'm enormously thrilled and excited about where I think this town is going. And I'm very happy to be a part of it. But I also very much welcome ideas, suggestions. Um, I see my colleagues from the Historical Commission here, and we always, always, always work together with them. We don't always agree, but we always work together, and that's the beauty of the process, is we find that middle ground. It's not easy. Again, it's hard work, but we do get there, and I'm very, very excited about that. Um, in closing, I just want to say um, thank you to everybody, and thank you to Andrew. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because he's got a big, long, interesting um, presentation to show you and walk us through. But I will say that the, the couple of the keys, changing that zoning was a big deal. Updating the zoning bylaw was a big deal. Our zoning bylaw was a disaster. I feel sorry for anyone that had to try and figure it out. Um, and getting an economic development plan, we worked with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, that laid out a strategy that said, if you want to do economic development, you have opportunity areas. And these are the opportunities. And for anyone that wants to take a look at it, that all these documents are on the website. I won't go through the whole uh, laundry list of, of what we included. But they're, they're the kinds of things that you would imagine where we, um, where we can fine tune zoning and we can really highlight the opportunity areas. Because it's like anything, we have to play on our strengths. And those strengths that, that Barry listed from the uh, economic development self-assessment tool, they were real eye-openers. We realized, we better get this permitting process a lot better. And we did, we, we put a guide together, and we made it easier. And I talk to the uh, staff in my office all the time and say, look, we're in the service business. We may work in a town hall, and you may be a building inspector, and I may be a planner, but at the end of the day, we're in the service business. And we're here to serve the public. That's what we do. And so I always keep an ear to the counter in those early mornings when the contractors come in, because every once in a while, there might be some um, discussion. And, uh, and I find myself running to the counter and looking over my building inspector's shoulder and um, him <coughs> looking back at me like, oh God, here she comes. <laughs> but I think that that's, that's really the, the message that I wanted to say is that I'm thrilled that everyone's here. We are open for business. And just because we work in the town hall doesn't mean we don't get business because we do. I've been a business owner with my husband. Um, I've been on both sides of it. I know what it's like and I know how hard it is. And small business is no easy nickel. So we want to work with the business community, and we look forward to um, bigger and better things for Red. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. <clears throat> Planners are indeed a different lot. One of Jean's colleagues yesterday was uh, trying to plan out November town meeting, and I was very frustrated because that's a long way off. <laughs> Imagine my frustration when I found out she meant a year from November. <laughs> <laughs> my planning horizon is about three hours. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank all the previous speakers and just uh, set the stage for our economic development director to come up. Uh, Reading has, if you don't know, a 92% residential tax base. We're no threat to become a booming commercial area, no matter what we do. Um, as, as Barry mentioned, the Selectman and I firmly believe we owe the community every opportunity to create tax revenues to support the operation of the town government and the schools. Um, 
as plainly as I can say it, uh, economic development translates into better town government and probably more importantly, better schools. Um, but a caution, our wildest success in economic development will not remove the need for Proposition 2.5 overrides in the future and probably in the near term. Um, as Jean has laid out, uh, we began the economic development journey several years ago. Some of it was only in my imagination. Um, a few years ago, we met with some of our local legislative delegation, officials from the town of Wakefield, members of the National Guard at Camp Curtis, and special thanks to uh, Representative Brad Jones for arranging a subsequent meeting with Secretary Ash. Um, and a very loud and public thank you to the Reading Board of Selectmen. Um, you've given us unwavering support in recent years, and your willingness to look so far ahead is very remarkable for an elected board, quite honestly. Uh, last week, Wakefield's town administrator, C. Steve Mayo, and myself each publicly announced our formal intentions to pursue building a shared public works facility at Camp Curtis. Uh, folks in the room and other officials, both in state government and the military, could think of no similar endeavor anywhere in the country. And their reaction ranged from being intrigued to doing cartwheels. Uh, by no means will this be an easy project to accomplish, but we do look forward to the opportunity to bring some pretty disparate groups together and try to work for the common good of all of us. I think all of us can win uh, something in this. For each community, probably a little bit more for Reading, uh, land vacated from our current DPW sites will yield incredible solid economic development potential. It's no surprise to me this would be our first big step in economic development. Before we hired our next speaker, Economic Development Director Andrew Corona, I warned him we had one-time funding good for three years. I suggested that over time we build a regional co coalition like Middlesex 3, a group of nine communities between Tingsboro and Lex Lexington along Route 3, who share the common goals of fostering economic development, <coughs> job growth and retention, and of diversifying the tax base and enhancing the quality of life. Thanks to the recent Economic Development Factors report created by Jesse Wyman, my views of economic development have changed quite a bit from where I was just a couple of years ago. It seems simple that the key to economic development was incremental property tax growth, uh, meaning you took vacant or underutilized land and you improved it. That seems simple. I couldn't have been more wrong. Of our peer communities, Burlington imports more workers than anyone else, as the amount of jobs in town represent 292% of their age 20 to 64 residential population. So they are importing workers. By contrast, Reading exports workers, as only 47% of our workforce could work in town. Further, the average annual wage for jobs in Reading is the lowest of all 25 peer communities at $40,000. Let me repeat that, of our 25 peer communities, we have the lowest average wage job in town. When Andrew first came here from the wilds of the West, uh, he spoke about how his background was always job creation, and I told him, well, you won't need that skill here, because we don't need that, and I was completely wrong. We need that. How can we possibly support economic development when our above average household income spends most of its day in Burlington? The mission here in Reading is indeed to develop underutilized land, but we need to attract and retrain and retain high quality jobs. It's now my pleasure to step back and introduce our Economic Development Director, Andrew Corona. Thanks so much, Bob. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, boy, what a, what a great, what a hard act to follow. Uh, a lot of dynamic speakers. One thing that makes me feel good about it is somebody really did a good job putting together this agenda. And all this people, a lot of hard work went into that. And, uh, well, I'm going to get into a PowerPoint presentation, the real, real exciting part of the day. But uh, what I want to do is uh, go quick. I'm going to have a couple guest speakers break up the monotony of hearing my voice. And um, hopefully, um, after, after some conversation we can uh, we can get for, get moving forward with some of the exciting aspects of doing economic development in town uh, again thanks to everyone in attendance um, my experience I came from Arizona I went to the University of Arizona I got a degree in regional development yes they do award degrees for regional development 
I spent some time in Glendale, which is in the western Phoenix metropolitan area. It's the home of uh, the Arizona Cardinals and the Phoenix Coyotes. So I had the opportunity to work on some of those exciting projects. Really, it was managing a lot of the explosive growth that Phoenix was, uh, was lucky to receive. After that, I went over to New Mexico and spent nearly a decade working for the New Mexico Partnership, which is the state's uh, privatized economic development recruitment entity. We were responsible for creating jobs by marketing the state as an attractive location for business. So about 50% of my time was spent on the road in Boston, in New York, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Atlanta, all over the country, not necessarily trying to poach jobs, but marketing the state is what we would say. Um, because of that, and, and, and what I heard in the last presentation from Secretary Ash, which was very impressive, is, is that he really gets it. Um, a lot of the modern day site selectors realize that any of the modern companies that you'd like in your backyard, their top three criteria for locating their facility and making their investments are labor, labor, and labor. That's where the modern companies are coming from. If you are competing on an operating cost basis, you're competing with the Mexicos and the Chinas of the world, and that's not a competition you want to have. People say race to the bottom, but uh, it, it was impressive to hear that from Secretary Ash. I appreciate it. Then moved up to Colorado, spent some time essentially selling my 10-year Rolodex of business and site selectors, and did some of that, mostly lead generation uh, sales. Then off to Seattle, where I worked for our TIP Strategies, a consulting group. <coughs> what we were doing there was the formalization of a group called the Washington Military Alliance. They were more or less trying to mitigate impending, at, at that time at least, impending future defense, federal defense reductions or budget reductions. So it was kind of brack proofing the state. It had a lot of exposure out there with all those military installations, primarily Joint Base Lewis McCord. After a while, I made my way down to the city of Kent. It was a city of 125,000 in between Seattle and Tacoma, really the economic engine of the metropolitan area. There's 45 million square feet of warehouse and industrial space, many Fortune 500 headquarters, and, uh, and, and, and it was an interesting experience. Um, after that, all the way over to Massachusetts. You may recognize this gentleman, former Speaker of the House from 1977 to 87, perhaps more importantly, and around these parts, he's a well-documented Red Sox fanatic, Tip O'Neill. One of his famous quotes is that all politics is local. I like to say that in my experience, all economic development is local as well. One of the first things I did when I landed at the town was to analyze the local definition of economic development. Um, Economic development around the country typically involves three aspects. One would be municipal revenue generation or growing the tax base. Another one is job creation. Another one is improving the quality of life. This, in my initial observations from other communities, wasn't necessarily the case. They have different definitions. Um, I commend our, well, I'll get into that in a little bit. Some of the other out of town are at, um, uh, observations. There's a really high quality of life. Everyone touched on that here. But it's a beautiful community. It's a pleasant downtown, great schools, low crime, lots of open space, high level of services provided to the residents, desirable place to live. Oftentimes, when I encounter people for the first time, I ask them, what are your thoughts of Reading? And what they generally say is that it's a very nice community. It speaks directly to the quality of life here. The next thing I saw is that there is an unparalleled level of public participation in Reading and in many of these uh, communities in the Boston metro area. I have never seen anything like this in any other community I've ever worked. Um, there's a little <laughs> this could be a double-edged sword. We'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> Next is uh, the job creation from a local and municipal level was not necessarily as much of a focus. There's a couple reasons for that. Job creation is, re is largely a regional activity. A lot of the local municipalities, we're a town of 25,000 residents. We don't really have the ability to impact some of these large scale location <coughs> decisions that Secretary Ash is involved in. And Reading, we enjoy some relatively low unemployment. We have a high median income, even if it doesn't take place in our backyard. So it had been, for some point in time, in a lot of communities, uh, low, on the, uh, low on the radar. Uh, next, I think we have 
very strong leadership here. Town staff is extremely competent. They're utterly dedicated to public service. Both private sector contacts and peer communities have been extremely complimentary of the planning staff. Our selectmen, they aren't politicians. They're champions for the community. They have impressive resumes and they graciously volunteer their time in hopes of making the town and their place, in their, uh, their home, a better place to live. Uh, again, a little redundant, and half of my presentation is going to be redundant, so bear with me. But everywhere else I've worked, job creation and growing the tax base are number one and number two. For reasons I've described, there's a little bit less of an emphasis on these two areas at the municipal level. One more thing I wanted to add that I think is unique <coughs> here is the, the, the uh, spirit of bipartisanship. You don't see that in other areas of the country. You really don't. Um, in Colorado, in New Mexico, in Washington, all these are fiercely diverse and, uh, and competitive places from a political perspective, and it, it breeds inefficiency in government. So that was another observation I just noticed. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, about our peer study. Um, folks have talked about that, but our economic de development liaison, Jesse uh, Wyman, I have Wilson written down here. <laughs> but uh, she recently completed a comprehensive peer best practice study. One of the purposes was meant to identify the key factors affecting CIP growth. This impressive study was one of the key foundational do documents guiding my efforts. And I have a spoiler alert for you. If you haven't read it, there is no silver bullet for economic development success. There are a variety of different, distinct, circumstantial factors affecting success, particularly if it's defined by CIP growth. The reason to be optimistic in this town, however, is that Reading possesses many of the advantageous um, success indicators identified in the study, such as a robust transportation infrastructure with four interstate access points. You've heard that already. We have a thriving commuter rail station, walking distance to the downtown, a highly educated workforce, very competitive electric rates, and extremely low tax rates, to name a few. Um, You'll hear me continue to pound this drum, but we have done the planning, and now it's time for, to take action if we're going to make any meaningful growth. I really like the saying, plan the work, now work the plan. I think we're at this point right now. Next, I wanted to talk about a couple of the new developments here in the town <coughs> that, uh, that we've seen in very recent, uh, very recent months. I know that uh, Liz Whiteland was, if she's still here in attendance, <laughs> uh, proprietor of Whiteland Books. They're a locally owned community bookstore located at 610 Main Street in the former Orange Leaf space. We are extremely excited to have this business here for multiple reasons. The proprietor, Liz, is an ex, uh, excuse me, She's exceptionally competent, she's creative, she's an engaged resident of town, and we think a bookstore is a great complimentary use to the nearby businesses, coffee shops, restaurants, etc. We're confident the bookstore will serve as a community gathering place with the plans Liz has for the business, particularly the events they're planning on hosting. These are placemaking activities that not only serve as community amenities to the residents, but they indirectly support the nearby businesses with increased foot traffic, supporting the overall vibrancy of downtown. Next, we have Cafe Nero. The highly anticipated cafe opened its doors in June this year to much excitement. European-style coffee house chain out of the UK has consistently garnered praise and awards for the quality of their coffee. It remains busy months after opening, and it's common occurrence to see a line out the door. I know this firsthand. <laughs> One of the first locations in the US, Reading is extremely grateful to have this bustling amenity in the heart of our downtown. Um, moving on. <laughs> uh, and before I even talk about, uh, talk about that, I'm going to bring up a guest speaker, Tom Connery, local developer. Uh, I don't want to steal all this thunder. I'm going to let him come up here and talk a little bit about the project, but I want to talk on a, touch on a few points of why it's so exciting for our perspective. It is locally owned. It's a uh, condo development, which promotes home ownership and a real sense of, uh, of, of ownership of community for most folks. There is a mixed use component. We'll have <coughs> several thousand feet of retail on the ground floor. Hopefully it will be a brewery. Right, Tom? <laughs> brewery. <laughs> um, in addition to that, there is an affordable component giving some of the residents of the town um, a place to live if they need one and can't afford it. Tom, I'll ask you to come up and I'll uh, turn the mic over to you to say a few words about this great development. Just forward. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, you can do that. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be among so many of my fellow citizens, uh, board members, and uh, state and local representatives. My name is Tom Connery. I am the principal of the Matrix Property Group, and we're headquartered down in Somerville. Uh, our office is located in a project that was formerly the offices of the AIM Safety Envelope Company. I joined the group in 2010 and we repurposed 300,000 square feet and have become an economic uh, development success in Somerville. And we currently have tenants such as Greentown Labs, which is a green tech, clean tech company. Andrew pointed out we do have a brewery, we have a rock climbing gym, and we've thought deeply about what adaptive reuse means. I am partnered with a man in Reading whose name is Paul DiBiase, and I'm joined this evening by Ta Paul's uh, son and daughter, uh, Hugo and Deandra, and they are part of our millennial team, and they bring a real sensibility to our thinking because they are sharp, they're edgy, and they're really helpful to what we're trying to create here. Back in October of 2014, C.B. Richard Ellis was marketing the <coughs> Reading Post Office for sale, and I joined a group of 21 proposers at that time and began the underwriting process. In June of 2015, it was down to nine proposers, and I was notified by the federal government that I was the successful bidder. I have been very proud to work in a collaborative spirit with the town of Reading. I have worked closely with Bob, with Jean, with the planning department, with Andrew, with our historical commission, and I think that we have what is going to be a very successful and exciting project that we now call Postmark Square. We have completed our hearing process successfully before the Community Planning and Development Commission. When I bought the building, when we bought the building, it came with a very unique attribute to it, and that was a historical covenant that was vested with the Mass Historical Commission. And we went through a planning process and came up with an idea. Uh, we uh, brought it down to Mass Historic, and they didn't think our idea was a good idea. And uh, I think a little bit of Reading didn't think it was such a good idea. So we scratched our head, and we worked uh, hard uh, on, on what it was that we were being asked to do. The second slide just provides a little bit of a context of where the building is located uh, along Haven Street. And I think the importance of this particular slide shows not only the building itself, but the parking lot behind it that will become uh, 50 uh, units of condominium residential housing. The entire building with the exception of the loading dock in the back is going to be preserved. The original building was built in 1918. The addition was put on in 1969. I thought that this was just sort of an interesting slide to share with you because it was one of the tools that we used to look at the historical perspectives of the facade of the building uh, when we were trying to understand what it was that we were preserving and why. So here are just a series of a couple of renderings of the uh, new project. Uh, Mass Historic's directive to us was that the new building cannot sit on top of the old building. Our idea was that perhaps it should be wedding caked and that we should try and join the old with the new. And with the wisdom of our local historical commission and with the assistance of Mass Historical, the idea was to move the building back off the 1918 building so that it sat as it does now uh, in and of itself. In doing that, we lost uh, five units. Um, we lost uh, 7,000 square feet of developable space. But thankfully, our parking ratio went from 1.33 to 1.44. Our parking is underneath the building. Uh, so we are trying to meet a lot of local objectives, which is to remove automobiles from the street, to pre preserve a historical structure, to be located near public transportation and to offer a project that is both residential and commercial. So these are simply uh, some illustrations of what the project will look like. And there's a little video that we will try and show here. I'm not sure that we can actually do it. You can so blame me. That is a Sorry. compilation of all our individual images put into a moving video that sort of gives a perspective along the sidewalk 
about what the project will look like. We're coming down Sanborn Street, and we're going to pivot at a new residential courtyard along Sanborn Street across from the Knights of Columbus Hall. That'll be the main entrance to the project. We're coming down, this is the 1969 corner of the building. We'll turn on, make a right onto Haven Street. You can see that we're preserving the granite wall in the front. You'll see the circular staircase, the American flag, and all those components that are so important to us locally uh, and historic with the building. Well, it wasn't like that when it was given to <laughs> <laughs> There's hurricanes even in Reading. <laughs> so thank you very much for the opportunity to share our project with you. And we look forward to working with the community. Thank you. 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 Members overwhelmingly, if not unanimously in my recollection, voted to expand the 40R overlay district in the downtown. <coughs> this zone allows for mixed use development and was a recommendation from the 2015 MAPC Economic Development Action Plan. The reason for this is because well-designed districts can create distinctive senses of place and fulfill market demand for walkable neighborhoods while steering growth towards areas with existing infrastructure, reducing development pressure on outlying areas and minimizing traffic impacts. As a direct result, we have seen a significant increase in the underutilized parcels in the downtown area of town, some of which anticipate we anticipate will materialize in the very near future. Effectively, what this did was increase the property values of every landowner in downtown Reading, one of which is currently in the design, uh, excuse me, the design permit phase, 24 Gould. Barry talked about this. Oh, sorry. Uh, 24 Gould, it might be a little premature to convey how the project will ultimately look as it's, as I mentioned, in the design phase, but we're excited to have the, the caliber of developer investing in Reading. Tregorth Companies has an extremely impressive portfolio with projects ranging from a ULI Kemp Award nominated 145 unit Boston condo slash apartment project to a 14 unit modern condo development rural Williamstown and everything in between. Tregorth is currently in the process of collaborating with the community and continues to refine the project with the goal of seamlessly fitting the, into the existing fabric and character of the community. Really looking forward to this project. Next, I wanted to talk about uh, a recent grant. As a result of the tireless work of the planning staff, and in particular, Julie Mercier, our community development director, the Town of Reading secured a $15,000 grant from the state earlier this year for the purposes of hiring a consultant uh, to assist with wayfinding and branding efforts. The purpose of the plan will be to capitalize on the downtown's unique identity and encourage patronization of businesses via ease of navigation. This was identified in Reading's master plan as a priority goal. With the funds provided from the grant, Favorman Design has been retained to assist in these efforts. They're a non-traditional creative, I'm sorry, creative design firm with extensive experience in Massachusetts applying creative tools and approaches to develop innovative and cost-effective solutions for clients ranging from corporate, commercial, institutional, and public. Favorman Design has worked with a variety of communities throughout the Commonwealth to assist with branding efforts and has an impressive resume of private experience from the Boston Red Sox to the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta and onto the U.S. Ryder Cup. Local working group has contributed to multiple brainstorming sessions with more to come in hopes of developing a consistent brand for the town. I think our next meeting is uh, coming up in the next week or so. Yeah, planner. <laughs> we'll get a chance to see some of the newest iterations of the design of the newly new town brand. We're excited. Parking, common issue everywhere, I think. Um, and it's common that we get uh, that we have to deal with this. I think it's such an issue commonly because everyone deals with it. And like anything else that people deal with, if it's, uh, if it's frequent encounter, uh, if it's common, uneventful, successful experience, you don't recall it. But rather, what you remember is the, uh, the occasional frustrations. There are various and sometimes conflicting demands for parking from distinct groups like downtown businesses, patrons of those business and downtown residents. 
I have a, plenty to talk about here. I'll save that for a later date, but, uh, but know that we're working on uh, formalizing, I'm sorry, updating a past study, a uh, comprehensive 2009 study that made recommendations to the plan. I think there's some real easy changes that we can make, diversifying the offerings that we have. Currently, it's just a bunch of two hour. We've heard from businesses that they'd like to see some quick turnaround for the convenience retail, and we need to see some long term so people can park, shop at a variety of different shops there. Um, that's something that we'll continue to work on. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, in addition to the constant input, I have firsthand participated in what I can only imagine to be as a number of input sessions on the, on the topic in hopes of better understanding the challenges of the various affected parties. We have a ways to go, but I anticipate having clear direction on how to proceed with a comprehensive parking strategy in the near future. And thanks goes out to Chamber Director Lisa Egan, who I think is walking in the door right now, so everybody <laughs> stare at her. Lisa, thank you for organizing the parking <laughs> input meeting with the downtown <laughs> retailers. My pleasure. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> oh, with the help of Jesse Wyman and our GIS administrator at the town, Kim Honeschlager, and by help, I mean they did the entirety of the work, absolutely everything. We have developed a new economic development website for the town. The idea behind the website was that we wanted to highlight more effectively the strengths of the downtown accessibility, affordability, responsivity, dedication to promoting, to providing a quality top-notch customer service experience, and, uh, and being pro-business. The hope is that this update will drive traffic to our economic development office where projects can be directed to the appropriate channel. If at all familiar with the previous website, you'll notice how much more professional looking and aesthetically pleasing this is. Again, not my doing, so thank you, Jesse. Um, I did want to take the time and briefly take a glance at some of the uh, functionality of the website. Um, one of the more exciting parts of this, in addition to a lot of the reasons like why Reading, our economic development plans, some information on incentives and such, is we now incorporate an economic development uh, real estate database. So if you click in on available properties or land, you can have an interactive real estate database. We, when doing our peer community, uh, peer best practice study, we saw very little of this <coughs> taking place. Occasionally, someone would update a CoStar annually with some information. Occasionally, they would have a link to LoopNet, but none of it was uh, primary research. Um, we have a Y Reading tab, talks about the advantages to doing business in the town. Um, we have different neighborhoods in the town highlighted, market potential as you can go in. This was supposed to be the fun part, but I think I'm losing some people. So uh, <laughs> the actual real estate aspect of it, available sites, we've actually put together and compiled some of this data and we can uh, direct folks right away to the appropriate <coughs> contact in town to direct them to uh, the businesses. Looks great. Again, that's, uh, that's, that's Jesse's job, or <laughs> that's Jesse's fine work. Uh, while it's still kind of in the process of being fully populated, we're confident this will be a valuable tool for groups interested in opportunities in town. And in addition to driving traffic and inquiries to our economic development division, an indirect benefit will be the positive impact on relationships with landowners and brokers and agents, as we're essentially partnering with them to promote their sites. So really excited about the new website. I implore everyone to go on there and browse and reply back to me with any bugs that you might find. <laughs> we'll fix them. Continuing on, there's a little bit more about the real estate. Um, I think the next thing we're going to talk about is future efforts. Um, revisiting the previous definition for ec local economic development and the need for focusing on municipal revenue generation via new and redevelopment, particularly in CO CIP as opposed to residential, we took an inventory of existing assets from a real estate perspective. The very limited amount of available commercial and industrial land, about 2.4%, nearly all of which is being currently utilized, only 0.1%, a tenth of a percent is currently vacant, uh, 
and the correlating low CIP growth, 0.22, you'll see that at the bottom of some of our peer communities, it made for an obvious challenge if the goal is to increase CIP without raising or splitting the tax rate. Immediately, we focused on an area where our efforts could be the most impactful. Walker's Brook, New Crossing Road, Ash Street, a few parcels of interest within the industrial area, but one that seemed most appropriate was the DPW garage parcel. You've heard folks talk about this, previous speakers. I'll hit on a couple key points of why it's such an exciting project. One, the existing DPW yard has numerous issues related to safety, ADA compliance, building code compliance, efficiency, most importantly, it's starting to struggle to meet the needs of the community today and more so in the future. This property is located in an area of prime commercial and industrial interest, has the potential to provide a higher and greater use for the community. Currently, the town doesn't collect property taxes. This area of town is currently being used for industrial and commercial purposes and it's tucked away from the majority of the residential neighborhoods in town. And unlike, unlike with privately owned property, the town has the ability to control the use of the land as it's owned by the town. And so we'll be able to direct what it will be used for in the future. Uh, we've been in communication with some of the commercial abutters and they've expressed support for these efforts. Uh, special thanks to town manager of Wakefield, Steve Mayo. I'm not sure if you're still here, but it's been a tremendous asset and a partner for us. Um, one of the first challenges we'll have to overcome is where do, we, where do we locate this facility? Coincidentally, my very first day on the, work, on the job here at the town was a meeting of the minds that I think was mentioned uh, that, uh, that Brad Jones set up. I was impressed with the level of support demonstrated at the meeting. It was another <coughs> indicator of the impressive leadership that we're so lucky to have here in Reading. Since this initial meeting, the support from our state leadership has been unwavering, and it's going to remain critical if, we, if, we, uh, if the project is to move forward. There are many hurdles we're going to have to overcome if we're to move forward with the project, but the risk of essentially dedicating town staff time is far outweighed by the potential reward that we have. We've done some preliminary feasibility analysis and nothing we've encountered to date seems like a challenge, uh, it seems like a challenge that's insurmountable. There are various noteworthy aspects of this effort that warrant excitement. One, the ability to effectively create land for economic development. We're creating land. It's exciting times. Two, we're looking at a potential regional facility, partnering with our neighbors to the south, Wakefield. This allows for us to share space, resources, and equipment, uh, excuse me, resulting in significant cost savings. To my knowledge, this is the first of its kind, first regional DPW facility proposed in the Commonwealth. My next guest speaker, Rick Freeberg, is going to come up and talk about a little bit about their experience. He's with a group called TEC. <coughs> Hi everybody, good evening, and uh, I'll, I'll try to go quick because I know uh, it's, it's been a long night already and we still have more to go. So uh, Andrew wasted no time uh, putting me to work right away. Uh, I think it was the, the first time we met, he said, hey, I got a site I want you to take a look at. Um, part of what our company does is we work for both um, public municipalities um, and towns, and we work for private developers. And when we're working for municipalities, we look at um, usually existing transportation infrastructure problems. Uh, or how can we improve transportation infrastructure to support new development? Um, so the town yard site was sort of a logical fit. Um, this is just a, an aerial photo of it. It's sort of right in the center of the photo there. Uh, you can see that the train tracks um, separated from sort of the rest of the commercial development that's, that's down in Walker's Brook. Um, these are just samples of, of other commercial developments that you've probably seen as you've driven by. Uh, th this is one um, in Woburn uh, Trade Center uh, 128. This one has office space on the upper floors, retail on the lower floors, and a restaurant that's in there. This is uh, 5 Wall Street in Burlington. This is more like a corporate headquarters type uh, setup. So, um, you know, again, it's a good, clean use. The buildings are typically valued very high, which is good for your commercial tax base. And this is another project on a much smaller site, actually, than the one that, that, that we're talking about here at the town yard. This is um, Andover Medical Center in Andover. It's 70,000 square feet of medical use, has an urgent care center, um, specialized doctors, that sort of stuff. Again, very clean, nice use, valued very high, so again, good for driving up your uh, commercial tax base. Um, so so these are just, those are just a few ideas on what's possible on the town yard site. But I think probably the most important thing, and it's been said a couple of times, but I just really want to drive it home. Uh, this is your asset, uh, the, the town yard site, and it's going to be a dialogue and a discussion on how you would like to proceed with it, how do you want to develop it, what do you envision on the site, what's important to you. 
uh, as, as you develop it. So those decisions are all in the future, but it's up to you uh, how that goes. Um, you know, if you decide to dispose of the land by selling it to somebody or, or leasing it to somebody, obviously that generates immediate revenue to the town. Uh, but then with the, along with an economic development project, you'd also see annual tax revenue year after year on top of that. So it's a great asset because right now you're not collecting any tax revenue on it whatsoever. And you have the potential to receive revenue for the sale of it and also year over year for the uh, property value. Um, just looking at the potential scale of a development that could come here, I think with very little work um, above and beyond what's already in place for zoning on that site, you could have somebody come to you with a 100,000 square foot development of a commercial uh, corporate headquarters type development. Um, the zoning that's there is already pretty good um, and would allow for something like that. Uh, if, if you stuck with the 100,000 square foot plan, which is, like I said, pretty much already uh, in place to propose there, you'd probably be looking at annual tax revenues of about 300,000. Um, which is significant. Uh, that, that represents about a 6% increase over your current CIP, uh, which is only $5 million a year. So that's a nice project. Uh, it would immediately become one of the top uh, taxpayers in your town. Um, but when we look at sites, we always think of what else is possible, what else could be done, how can we maximize, because these opportunities are few and far between. So if there's ways that we can look at you know, what flexibility in zoning or acquiring other parcels, what might be possible on the site, and if any of those things are, are worked on, and dug into as these decisions um, are, are discussed by the town. Um, you know what, what's possible here is probably something up to about a half a million square feet. And in terms of being, um, um, you know, in terms of annual tax revenue, about 1.2 million a year, which is a game changer. I mean, that's a that's a 24 percent increase over your current five million dollars CIP. So that one is a roll up your sleeves. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take acquiring additional land. It's going to take um, figuring out some some challenges with, with the zoning. Um, but the range is there. It's anywhere from a nice, very nice project, <coughs> nothing wrong with $300,000 a year, but the potential is to grow it up to something like 24% uh, year over year. That, that, that's annual revenue to the town. So I just want to give a quick overview of what's possible on the site, and I'll turn it back to uh, Andrew. Thanks, Rick. Now for the fun part, uh, the visioning process. This is a chance where the residents of Reading can come together to determine what the future looks like. We as a community are at an inflection point. Some of you might remember the game show, Let's Make a Deal. This could, be, this could describe our situation. If door one uh, was an increase in taxes, if door two was a reduction in the level of services provided by the town, door three would be economic development. We have just released a brief nine question survey on the economic development website, which we also intend on distributing to other members of residents of town. The purpose of the survey is to begin the process of reimagining the industrial area of Reading. The most exciting part of the whole process is that we not only have the opportunity to peek behind that third door, but we can determine what's behind it. Doing so is going to require the community to band together and devise a realistic, <coughs> shared vision for what's behind that third door. One thing the town has going for it, which I previously mentioned, was community participation. This unparalleled community participation can be a great thing, and it often manifests itself in exceptional levels of volunteerism. Our resident base is exceptionally knowledgeable about the local government process, and this process is in place to ensure the most desirable outcome possible for all the residents. There is a flip side to this coin, though, and we call it NIMBY, or NIMBYism. I had a couple anecdotes or stories in here if I needed to kill time, but I see that I'm right on schedule, so I'll leave you with one brief one. It makes me recall one of the first people I've met, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, since I've been in town, Reading's favorite son and 50-year town meeting member, Bill Brown. During one of my first interactions with Bill, he informed me that nimbyism would sabotage my efforts, and because of that, he saw economic development as a waste of time and money. He then reinforced this belief at town meeting where he proposed a 50% cut in the economic development budget. <laughs> it was a pretty interesting introduction to local government in New England, to say the least. <sighs> I have more stories I can tell, but I know that everybody's tired. It's right on schedule. And what I want to say is uh, let's all work together. Let's think about the things and let's collaborate on how we can make Reading a better place from an economic development perspective. Uh, there are various channels of communicating with the town, but uh, I'll be a lightning rod. Uh, you can direct your ire at me, your ideas at me, and I'm a pretty responsive guy. 
Thank you, everyone, for attending. I really appreciate it. Some of us will stick around if you have any questions or comments.